Welcome. This is Money Heart, where we explore the emotional side of money. I'm Camille Diaz, and today we're discussing transparency during the aging process. My guest is Cheryl Doyle, owner of True Blue Confidence and Dementia Care. Cheryl, welcome to Money Heart. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, you're very welcome. Glad to have you here. Um, for you, the history of saving kind of tracks all the way back to your grandmother who didn't even have to use her pension. So can you share that story with us a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So my my grandma, my mother's mother is called, or was called Grandma Lydia. And um, she went through two world wars. My grandpa was in the Navy. And... Um, so he was away for very long periods of time. So my grandma took care of all the financial stuff. He'd be gone away sometimes for two years. Um, he actually survived three torpedoes where the ship went down. Um, and my grandma brought up my mother through World War II. So she was used to rationing. Um, she was extremely what I call thrifty. Um, she was always saving. She never spent on herself. She reused everything. She had a cupboard under the stairs that was full of jars, bottles, cans, ribbons, yarn, everything. Nothing got thrown away. Um, and when she, when she passed away, she was, she was just a few months off being 100. And um, my mother was her only executor, a um, single child. And when she was cleaning out her apartment, she went to the closet and opened the door and there was papers and papers and plastic bags just piled up. And that was her financial accounting system. Oh, wow. uh, it took my mother six to 12 months to work out that she had between 40 and 50 different savings accounts in different banks, in different building societies, different co-ops. It was, it was like a nightmare. So, um, although she'd been really thrifty, um, and it's, you know, extremely good with the money, she saved a huge amount of money considering, you know, she'd just been on pension. There was a lot of money left. It was just very hard to find it. Right. So. Yeah. So that must've been pretty rough for your mother then trying to figure out what this pile of plastic bags and note papers and, and yeah, she, couldn't, that was. Yeah, she couldn't believe it. She could not, she couldn't get over it. So she was literally pulling her hair out. Um, and because I'm in America and she's in England, so I wasn't really able to help. But every time I phoned up every Sunday, it was a process. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, she, she got, she got through it all. But I think now that I will be going into a different era, I think from that, my mother's, learned from that and um you know she i will probably inherit a very different system i don't think i'll have the plastic bag method of filing <laughs> plastic bag filing system yes yes yeah. oh gosh so in what you do in your line of work um you're typically working with families to teach the family members how to care for their loved ones who have dementia yes how does this kind of play in as far as that communication piece? Because I'm sure your, your mother and grandmother is not the only situation where this has happened. What do you yeah. typically see out there as far as people talking about their finances as they start to age? Um, I think it's a very difficult dis discussion to have. Um, it's very emotional and People with dementia, especially at the beginning of dementia, I call them diamonds, um, diamonds and emeralds. They want to be in control. They need help, but they don't know it. And they certainly don't want anybody telling them what to do with their money or anything else. Thank you very much. I, you know, you don't get to tell me what to do. Um, so it's, it's critical with my clients is that we have that discussion, you know, right at the beginning of the diagnosis. Um, and there's got to be trust and respect in that relationship for mum and dad to sit down and be open about it. Um, so from my, you know, the, the role is being reversed here. And what I do with my families is help my adult children do that role reversal. Now the children are taking care of mum and dad. And 
you know, that's not an easy thing to do is to make decisions for your parents. So a lot of my clients, I'm like a neutral person. Somebody has got experience in aging in all different levels of care and they can just bounce off me. Okay. This is a situation. You know, what are my options? What, you know, what, what am I going to do here? Um, and when you're talking about options, you know, we talk about, you know, what does aging look like? You know, mum or dad, what does aging look like to you? You know, where do you want to be in five to 10, 20 years? And they might say, well, I want to, I want to be at home. Nothing else. You never take me out of this home. You'll take me out in a coffin. I'm, I'm staying here. Okay. Or it might, well, I'm actually quite social and I might be all right in a facility. So yes, yeah, so I don't want to live. I don't want to be by myself or I want to come and live with you or, you know, but at this point you have, you have all those conversations. Um, and at that point it's okay, well, this is what you want to do. Then let's talk about how much is that going to cost? Um, cause if you want to stay at home and let's say you needed, you know, you needed somebody to come in and help, then what sort of a budget have we got? Um, and then you might find, well, we're not, we, we haven't got the money to support that. So we, we need to either find another mechanism or, you know, get some outside help on how we're going to have that money. Um, and it's, um, oh, my computer's doing things here. It's, um, it's about having, letting them know that the goal is to help them get what they want. Um, so I've got a couple of um, little guidelines here. Is that a good? Is this a good time to talk through them? Yeah, that'd be perfect. Because you brought up a great a great point of you know, this is a big switch for the kids. Is you, know, you grow up and your parents tell you what to do, and your parents guide you and lead you and mentor you, and then all of a sudden it, the script is flipped, and now you have to lead and guide your parents because mm -hmm. they can't anymore. And that's a really hard transition for a lot of people. I would, I would think that not only does the person, the parents not want to mm -hmm. make that change, I would think the kids might not want to make that change either. I think a lot of the kids are bothered about making the right choice. Mm. Because some, some kids, you know, they have different priorities. Um, but you do the families that I work, they want work with the, the children want the absolute best. For their parent they want to make the, the right choice because you want to get one shot at this sure you know um and especially if somebody's got dementia if you are going to place them in a facility you know you, you really you're really going to get one try at that because if you it's very stressful so if you find a place and you move them there but then oh, i'm not quite sure about this then you move to them to another place and another place then then they're just going to keep declining every time you do that move wow. so it's you know, it's, it's good to have somebody that, you know, knows all the different facilities and all you've got to match. You've got, it's got to be a good match. You've got to understand, does that person like, you know, even whether it's at home is matching the caregiver because there's no point staying at home and having a caregiver and mum feels like she's got to entertain that person because it puts stress on her. You know, it's got to be, a, it's got to be, she's that person's got to look forward to that caregiver arriving and accepting the help offer right. similarly if you're in a facility do they like large places do or do they like would they prefer something much smaller you know how much entertainment do they want you know are they introvert are they extrovert you know what are their interests um so everything's got to be everything's got to be matched up um yeah. but no a lot of you know in terms of the child role it's um it's, it's very it's very difficult but the key is to maintain your, you still want to be the child because you're still the mother daughter or the mother father, but then you've got to make these decisions on top of that. So you still got to be respectful that they are 80 or 90 and they may have dementia and they may not be able to make their own choices, but they've had a full life and they've had a career and raised children and you know, we don't get to talk to them in a childish or demeaning manner because of that or take control. So it's very important that we have these, this communication in the right way. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's perfect. Um, before we get into kind of, you had a, a few steps that we needed to take, but let's go into kind of what the signs are that someone we care about might be entering this and we don't know, we don't have a diagnosis yet. 
but we're suspecting something is not going quite right. Yeah, and this might be especially if mom or dad's in Tulsa and you're out of state, you're in Florida or California, so you're not there every day. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say you come home and you're here for Thanksgiving and you get there and all of a sudden there's a mail that's backed up. Mom, mom or dad, they're not, they're not opening the mail or you get to the mail and it's reminders and it's final reminders and you realize that they're not paying the gas or the electric bill. Um, and mum and dad has always been meticulous over the years, paying the bills, you know, never had a reminder, because um, nobody gets one of those, do they? Um, <laughs> no, nobody's ever had a reminder. None of our listeners, no, no reminders ever. <laughs> um, but no, they've always had, you, you, you thought that they were able to do that. Um, and it could be sometimes that the gas and electricity even get turned off, you know, um, so that is a sign that there's something not right. So if you go into mum and dad's home, and let's say they were always very tidy, um, and they were always very clean, but all of a sudden you walk in and they're not bathing anymore, but you go to the refrigerator and it's got out of date food or, you know, milk that's gone off, or there's hardly any food there. Um, or the house is just a mess and they're not doing any lawn. All these are indicators that something's not right. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, for this conversation, you know, it's, it's the finances. You know, you've got to make sure that, A, they're taking care of their own bills, but similarly, that nobody else is taking advantage of them. Um, and I did a little bit of uh, research about elder abuse, um, and apparently 90% of abusers are either family, close friend, or acquaintances. Oh, gosh. That's a huge number. Yeah, it is. Um, and I, when I ran my home care agency, I actually was given a couple to take care of 24-7, and they had fallen prey of being taken advantage of um, by a, a scam that was promising them a million dollars. You know, if you give so much money, then, you, you know, it's kind of like a lottery system. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the other thing, is people are asking them for money, and um, they think, oh, you know, I like to give to everybody. So you've got to watch all the donations that they're giving as well. So Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So definitely watching for any signs of things, just, just totally out of the ordinary, where you go, that's completely out of character for mm -hmm. what my parent or loved one would normally yeah. have done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Similarly, if normally they're, you know, they played bunko once a month or they met the ladies or went for lunch or things like that. And all of a sudden, no, I don't want to go to that anymore. Is that the beginning of dementia, people re retreat into themselves because they don't want to look bad in front of their friends. They don't want people to notice yeah. that they're not quite keeping up as they used to. So they become more isolated, which in turn makes the depression, the uh, dementia worse. Right, right. So once we've identified this or they just get their diagnosis, um, what, are the, what are the next steps to take to be ready and make sure that, that we get this conversation going? Because I, for what I understand from you is it's super important to talk about it as early as possible and not wait. Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, if you've just had a diagnosis of any kind of dementia, or any, any kind of illness that um, affects the cognitive ability, um, then that's when we need to be having those conversations. You need to have the, those conversations before the crisis occurs. Um, and so, you know, don't wait until mum's fallen over and broken a hip, um, or we're not pay, paying the bills anymore. Um, it's critical. I've got some gentle rules here for having that conversation. Um, it's about being respectful. Don't be authoritative because it's still their money. They've worked for it. It's their little nest egg. Be transparent. Don't have a hidden agenda or your own goals of where you want the money to go. Um, be clear that this is not about you taking control of, of their money, of their lives, of their house. This is about helping them achieve, you know, what aging looks like for them. Um, and 
I would encourage creating a plan, a financial plan together or an aging plan together, discussing the next steps, um, seeking outside advice. You know, no, nobody's a specialist in, in everything. Um, so seek outside advice um, and then sh schedule future conversations. This is an ongoing process. It's, it's not one and done. Mm -hmm. You know, you start the process and even understanding where mum and where mum and dad or mum, you know, whoever it is, your loved one, you know, how they see themselves aging. You know, have that conversation up front, so you're not trying to guess what your person wants, and then and they're not able to tell you anymore. Um, so, and, and with that, when you when you into that conversation, it's you know you, you need to know where the documents are. You're not like my mother, they got bags and bags of, got, uh, of pieces of paper. Um, so the, the Alzheimer's Association actually has a really nice, they have a, a printout online of, of all the documents and accounts. So you almost need to know bank accounts, savings accounts, uh, you know, everything. You need to know where that is. Um, but for me, when I'm looking at care, I want to know, you know, if mum and dad have been a veteran, you know, can we get veterans benefits? And that most of the one I used to work with was called aid and attendance allowance. And this will pay for you to have care in the home. Um, so that's critical. But something like that will take three to six months to get that. So you can't just snap your fingers. You know, you, you're going to work through a process. M you know, Medicaid, is that something we're going to have to use? Okay, well, we need to talk to a, a Medicaid expert as to, you know, what age do we have to do and how much do we pay into that? Long-term care. Do mum and dad have a long-term care policy? And I used to go to a lot of family consultations um, talking about money and how we're going to pay for home care. And then I might say, well, do you have a long-term care policy? And they go, mum, do you have a lot? And they went, oh, yeah. And they didn't even know it existed. And that's like a golden, a golden egg. Because once you can get into that and you... You know, you need to know if they have a long-term care policy. Okay, well, what, what does it entitle them to have? If it entitles them to have home care, what are the criteria to, to, to trigger that payment? And, you know, how many hours can I have? And what does that translate to, to how many hours a week? Um, so this really helps you think, okay, well, if mum just needs four hours three times a week to help, then, then that's doable. But if mum or dad needs 24-7, then that, you know, the long term care maybe will, will not pay for all that. Right. Um, so there's, there's basics of medical and financial information. Do you want me to keep going? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I know you kind of have a list of what things we need to put in place and talk to an attorney, a financial person, mm -hmm. all of those to, to kind of get that set up as soon as possible. Yeah. So this is, this is a very broad answer here but the, the basics for medical information would be um, knowing about their living will their durable power of attorney uh, for health care you need to know what their medical directives are um, and whether there's a do not resuscitate very important if there is a do not resuscitate that we pin it on the fridge you know we don't have it in a folder that's in the back of a cabinet that's locked. Because if EMSA do arrive and knock on the door, they don't mess about. They have to see that piece of paper straight away. They're not going to wait for you to find the key to get to the cabinet. Um, so it's got to be clearly found. On the financial side, if there's a will, if there's a living trust, and durable power of attorney for finances. And all these things, are all those points, medical and financial, are things, you know, when we're having that discussion, this is very emotional, we're sitting down with mum and dad, and mum and dad need to decide, well, you know, this child, I'd like you to be in charge of my medical side, but this child, I'd like you to be in charge of the financial side. Um, or it might be the eldest child is going to be looking after everything, you know? Um, so, um, you know, very political, very emotional for the whole family. Um, yeah, because maybe have that, uh, to the intense discussions between the siblings when mm -hmm. discussing who's going to be in charge of what, who's going mm -hmm. to manage what, 
how they're going to make decisions together. Mm -hmm. um, is it important to appoint someone as the decision maker because the committee mm -hmm. thing gets too difficult? How, what's your experience? On yeah, that? well, my, 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 well, in my experience, well, I, I'm lucky, I was an only child. So with my mother's estate, I'm it. I'm the power of attorney for everything. But with my father, he remarried. So he's, my, my sister is a doctor. And so she's in charge of the medical side. And I think he's, I think I'm in charge of the financial side. Um, so it's given us different roles. Um, but I have a, another client that I deal with and there's her and two siblings, but the siblings don't really want to be involved. So she's kind of Johnny on the spot in Oklahoma. So she's got the whole shebang and the siblings don't really care. They don't really, really want to be part of it anyway. So very personal for family yeah, every the, yeah there's yeah. there's no there's no one answer every single situation will will be different mm -hmm. um but you know to be responsible with your parents and to have it you know bef before the dementia gets too far in the way and then they're not able to have these have these discussions um is to understand what their preferences are um is that a good way to get the conversation started? Because I would imagine there are a lot of parents who don't really want to have this talk. Um, so maybe asking preferences, could that sort of open the door to talking about some of these other things that are a little harder? Yeah. To discuss? And I have to say, even though, you know, I ran a home care agency for 10 years, having that discussion with my parents um, is is still is very difficult i mean most of my parents you know they both live independent lives and um you know i can feel myself getting a bit you know um anxious trying to raise and so my father's an attorney so he's very difficult to talk to you know at what point do you tell your attorney father can we just have a conversation and i want to make sure everything's in place for when you get older you know um and i know there's let's let's go out for dinner and let's talk about it but let's just plan a sit down um and i you know from my point of view i, I want to know i want to know that i'm following through your wishes you know should something happen i want to i want to know what what you would want to happen um i think that's a okay. great point of making it clear that you are trying to make sure you're doing what they want and mm -hmm. you're trying to make sure that what they want to happen is what actually happens and that you don't make a decision that goes against what they wanted. So Absolutely. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that if, if somebody came to me with that, it would probably still be a hard conversation, but at least it's coming from the point of, okay, you really want to know what my wishes are rather yeah. than, oh, great. You're going to tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah, if you, yeah, I, I mean, whether somebody's got dementia or not, they don't want their children telling them what to do. <laughs> so it's going the, the wrong way. But I mean, once you've had that dis discussion and you've created that aging plan, I mean, really, everybody should have an aging plan in place. That's when the hard work comes because it's, then it's like, okay, well, well, we've got some financial gaps here, or we don't, we don't have our ducks in a row. You know, or well, I actually want to do a living trust, or I want to do a will, or yes, I, I'm actually a veteran. Okay, well, where's the where's the veteran number? Oh, I don't, you know, I don't know where Dad's veteran's ID number is. Okay, well, we we need to find that. And all these things take a long time. I mean, all the families I've worked with, I mean, the paperwork is you know quite gruesome that they have to go through, um, and a lot of people are doing it for the first time. Um, so um so really just getting started early and a little piece at a time you know this weekend yeah. we'll figure out the veteran number this weekend we'll figure out you know who we want to talk to about finances then we'll take a break for two weeks while we get our papers together then we'll figure out you know the next piece instead yeah. of just lump it all in one yeah. one day yeah. exactly and i'm a big proponent of you know not taking control away but making them feel part of that discussion and hopefully having these discussions and having all those information and documents in the right place takes stress away from them. Um, it's all about, you know, reducing stress and reducing anxiety. Um, so, I mean, I can only think for myself, 
if my kids wanted to have that conversation with me as I got older, um, that I would feel probably peace of mind knowing that they know, they know that I've made provisions and they know where everything is and then they know what I want to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still my, my wishes. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing all this wonderful information with us. I really appreciate it. No, you're welcome. Uh, if you would like to get in touch with Cheryl or find her online, you can do so through her website, truebluecares.org. It's spelled T-R-U-B-L-U-C-A-R-E-S.org. Thank you as well to all of our listeners and viewers. I'm your host, Camille Diaz. This show is sponsored by Serenity Financial, a Five Rings financial agency specializing in education, living benefits, and guaranteed lifetime income. Today's money mantra is, I can have open conversations about money.